Films and technology have a special relationship. In His Girl Friday, the phone became a plot device, allowing for the expansion of the diegetic world. In American Graffiti, the car becomes a venue for socialization, personal agency, relationship formation, and hookups. Cars are anonymous capsules that propel the plot in Taxi Driver, Collateral, and more recently, Nightcrawler. And yet, while there are commentaries about these technologies across cinema, there is no uniform condemnation of them. They are instruments for the same human stories that we have always told. This is a trend across nearly all contemporary technologies. Even pseudo-social outcry about the damaging effects of video games and popular culture itself has largely escaped popular critique. Let's examine the smartphone in film. What does popular media have to say about this thin, electronic brick we all carry? Media, perhaps more than anything else, presents the possibility for a universal pull. Popular media is universal in the sense that it cannot be escaped without significant effort. A film which presents a normative claim about something we agree on may be as close to a collective social assertion as we can get. This is not to say media always reflects a uniform opinion of society. There are many contentious films, for example. But consider how fiction makes sense, even while utilizing the settings and rules of fictional, and often entirely alien, worlds and characters. I claim, if fiction makes sense to us, it is because we interpret it as representing not our experiences, but our judgments. Hey guys, Kayla back here with another video. Uh, okay, so the topic of today's video is putting yourself out there. Um, okay, so like, what does that mean? Where is there? Well, there can be anywhere that you wouldn't usually go, you know, maybe because it's like weird or scary or um, something like that. Eighth grade depicts the days leading up to 13-year-old Kayla's eighth grade graduation. The film was directed by comedian Bo Burnham, known for his cynical, yet unexpectedly warm, view of life. The central conflict of the film revolves around Kayla's inability to form social connections. Kayla's phone takes on the agency and characteristics of a character within the movie, guiding her friendships, adolescence, and self-doubt. The effective agency of the smartphone is played in contrast to the apparent ineptitude of her well-meaning father, illustrating a displacement of her family connections and a perversion of her personal relationships, while her maturity is tied to a series of representations derived from her smartphone, all of which provide a sense of distorted escapism. The final message of 8th grade is a hopeful one, with Kayla embracing her identity in spite of social rejection she finds from the world at large. She reverts to her personal connections and the iconoclastic character of Gabe. This is the start of a theme in its most basic form. The solution to the artifice of social media can be found in the idiosyncrasies of deep personal connection. It's been found that young women, particularly those around Kayla's age, have seen a massive decline in their mental well-being, including self-harm. This appears to be correlated with the introduction of the smartphone. While correlation is not causation, in the words of Jonathan Haidt. So there are a lot of graphs like this. So this is from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. So the, so the federal government and also Pew and Gallup, there are a lot of, of organizations that have been collecting survey data for decades. So this is a gold mine. And what you see on these graphs over and over again is relatively straight lines up until around 2010 or 2012. And on the x-axis, we have time, years going from 2004 to 2020 on the y-axis is the percent of US teens who had a major depression in the last year. Mm -hmm. That's right. So when this data started coming out around, so Jean Twang's book, iGen 2017, a lot of people say, oh, she, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. This is just self-report. Like Gen Z, they're just really comfortable talking about this. This is a good thing. This isn't a real epidemic. And literally the day before my book with Greg was published, the day before, uh, there was a psychiatrist in, in New York Times who had an op-ed saying, relax. Cell phones, uh, smartphones are not ruining your kid's brain. And he said, it's just self-report. It's just that they're, they're, they're giving higher rates, there's more diagnosis, but underlying there's no change. No, because 
these gra- these it's theoretically possible, but all we have to do is look at the hospitalization data for self-harm and suicide, and we see the exact same trends. We see also a very sudden, big rise um, around uh, between 2009 and 2012. You have an elbow, and then it goes up, up, up. So and that is not self-report. Those are actual kids admitted to hospitals for cutting themselves. Nosedive takes place in a near future world where social capital has been made explicit. A point-based system is used to evaluate your social worthiness, which can be used for everything from renting a car to applying for a loan. This score is the amalgamation of the judgments made by those around you. We follow the film's lead, Lacey Pound, on her way to the wedding of a friend, a woman who just so happens to have a much higher social score than Lacey. Commentary on this episode tends to revolve around the absurdity of social media, because when the superficiality seen on Instagram is made physical, it is shown to be absurd, or so we're told. But more precisely, this film demonstrates the sensibilities we have towards our social capital. In a sense, this is our most primitive form of currency, hearkening back to our hunter-gatherer days. We see civilizations with no form of monetary currency depend on a form of social credit to maintain order. In the words of David Graeber, the key distinction here is between currencies that are used primarily to further the exchange of material goods and those primarily used to transform social relationships. The first can be referred to as commercial currencies because even though they may be used for social purposes, their primary purpose is seen to lie in buying, selling, renting, or otherwise disposing of alienable property. The second should best be referred to as social currencies. They may also be used to buy and sell material goods, and often they are, but not always. But their primary purpose is seen to lie in arranging marriages, resolving conflicts, consoling mourners, making treaties, assembling followers for military expeditions or competitive feasts, making gifts or rewarding services. For this reason, I also propose to call those economic systems in which social currencies predominate human economies. What made the system work, according to Graeber, was the fact social credit systems were more personal and humane than comparable market economies. However, in digital economies, market forces drive all outcomes towards consolidation or winner-take-all economies of social equity. The principle of social equity, which was absolutely necessary for our prehistoric ancestors to survive, forge relationships, mate and reproduce, now exists in an entirely other domain which serves market forces and the effects of digital consolidation. If social currency today is represented by the worlds of Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, then we live in a world that would make even pre-revolution France appear egalitarian. Social media does not just expand the implicit into the explicit. It introduces a market-driven middleman into the equation. In a world where social engagement necessarily generates market returns for shareholders, we should expect only those actions which are deemed market viable to be rewarded. Notice how your breathing continues all by itself. Smithereens is a deconstruction of the powers that be behind social media. It is common for campaigners for social equity and justice to present those in power as being fundamentally corrupt, aware of their own greed, and reveling in their own gluttonous lifestyles. As comforting as the us versus them narrative is, it is probably insufficient to understand the grip social media has on our society. Chris Gilhaney, a normal-looking rideshare driver, kidnaps an intern at a tech company called Smithereens, and after a run-in with the police, finds himself stranded in a field in a standoff with law enforcement. Chris has only one demand, to speak with the CEO of the tech company, Billy Bauer. What ensues is a drawn-out encounter with law enforcement while the CEO of the company is in his tech detox in Utah. When Chris is granted his wish, He explains his actions were in response to the trauma of a car crash that killed his fiance. Is that Christopher? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. The inside of this short film 
is its prescience to understand the symmetry between the two characters' positions. There is a sense in which Chris recognizes he was made to be dysfunctional, unfit for the role he needed to play as boyfriend and fiancé. And while Chris is unable to fulfill his role as a boyfriend, Billy Bauer is unable to fulfill his own ideals for a company that exists beyond his control. Both are caught up in the wake of the incentives and ownership rights of a large tech company. The firm also displays the comparative impotence of government to understand and handle the situation, reflecting a fundamental asymmetry of power between the democratic structures of liberal democracies and their unwillingness to influence economic engines they purport to govern. I don't know what to say to you, okay? That's the truth. I don't know what to say. I don't know what you want me to say. I know it was me. It was me. I was driving. It was my fault. It, it wasn't supposed to be like this. Our whole platform, I swear to God, it was like it was one thing when I started it, and then it just, I don't know, it just became this whole other fucking thing. The commentary of social media within film is a fundamentally social and economic one. This leaves us with the question, where can we go to find a study of individuals as commodities within a larger capital structure? The capture of apparent agency under the umbrella of corporate oppression in techno-noir cyberpunk worlds has its origins in the 1940s. Burning beneath the apparent prosperity of the post-war 40s and 50s lingered a distinct distrust for the government, society, and corporations. The detective in a 1940s noir may escape from the backstabbing setup he finds himself in, but his partner, his lover, his boss, Someone would always pull him back in and prove his agency was just an illusion. 20th century philosopher and one of the earliest theoreticians to consider the implications of mass media, Guy Debord writes, In societies dominated by modern conditions of production, life is presented as an immense accumulation of spectacles, and real life is materially invaded by the contemplation of the spectacle and ends up absorbing it and aligning itself with it. During a period marked by consumerism and the forceful decline of sociability, the media of the day clung to the theme of individuation being compromised as more agency was ceded to impersonal forces that lurked in the shadows. It was in this cauldron that film noir was born, the precursor to the techno-noir of cyberpunk. Cyberpunk cities are a powerful analogy for the online world accelerating technological change that proceeds as a force separate and transcendent to the humanity it was originally intended to serve. Cities are like compost heaps, William Gibson writes, just layers and layers of stuff. In cities, the past and the present and the future can all be totally adjacent. Contact between the inhabitants of this near future are all mediated through a medium of digital communication intended to support corporate interests that are as vague and disinterested as the will of God. There is no moral judgment in the depths of cyberpunk cities, only indifferent, market-driven action. Cyberpunk has been returning to the stage in recent years, seeing a resurgence in its popularity driven by series such as Edge Runners. Originally conceived via the cybernetics movement of the mid and late 20th century, cyberpunk has found new life in today's cinematic worlds. The frenetic rise of retellings within this dystopian world, fueled by new anxieties surrounding the breakdown of globalization and the inability of a global community to rally around climate change. In this sense, cyberpunk offers a warm surrender that beyond all the fear and worry for a future, there is an immediate now a plethora of emotion and sensation to experience here as a form of surrender against an uncertain and depressing future. Beyond the thematic commonalities, there are literal parallels between today's technological society and cyberpunk worlds. The centrality of attention within cyberpunk takes on a religious quality, something that must be admired and revered above all else. 
Appropriately, the walls and halls of this new cyber society are covered in an endless splay of advertisements, dopamine-inspired appeals to sex, sugar, and the commercialization of connection. It is difficult to imagine a better physical depiction of the infinite scroll. Once again, our anxiety in media has a very real basis. In his book, Human Compatible, Stuart Russell, commonly known as the founding father of artificial intelligence, discusses the further reduction of people as operating less as signals to be optimized against and more as signals that themselves require optimization. Like any rational entity, the algorithm learns how to modify the state of its environment, in this case, the user's mind, in order to maximize its own reward. Like the heroes of cyberpunk worlds, we live under market conditions that are anti-human. Gone are the foundations of our evolutionary past. They've been replaced with concrete and sheet metal, bots and engagement figures. The familial and the other constructs of care are useless relative to the endless optimization and capture of the market. Increasingly, our jobs look less like they were improved and optimized by the capital systems we've constructed. Instead of going to the store, we can send someone else. We should not care for our parents when they grow old. We have facilities to do this. We should not walk our dog. We have an app for that. Meanwhile, service and gig workers perform increasing amounts of emotional labor to sustain the automation of care. This analogy extends in media, not just to consumers, but to us as workers. The rise of the gig economy were tasks which previously bound together families and friends, such as going to the store and caring for the young and elderly, are all falling under the blanket of GDP, where they are captured by the efforts of overqualified workers without adequate pay or benefits. Even the oligarch ruling over his hypothetical tech company in Smithereens is depicted as having no control of the leviathan he created. In Nosedive, the same principle is at play in that relationships between the characters are all mediated by socialization according to a marketplace. Dostoevsky once said, If one wanted to crush and destroy a man entirely, to mete out to him the most terrible punishment, all one would have to do would be to make him do work that was completely and utterly devoid of usefulness and meaning. The 90s had office work and fight club, where the mundanity of work, the purposelessness of day-to-day -day labor, oppress the workers of the day, and yet the heroes of these worlds are redeemed through a return to a baser, more liberated humanity. Today, we have cyberpunk, where the instincts for violence, sex, destruction, creed, anger, pain, defeatism, nihilism, and even counterculture are all imprinted into a singular unit of marketability. You can be enraged, joyful, familial, attracted, but you may not do so outside the reach of the market. There is a common thread between all these films. The guilt-ridden boyfriend of Smithereens, the 13-year-old girl in 8th grade, the panicked bridesmaid and nosedive. They are all trying to escape a socially enforced prison. So what? Don't all film protagonists have to escape some conflict? That's why we watch films. But these protagonists are different. They are trapped in an artificial prison. These are not the stoic heroes of sword and sandals epics. These are not the coming-of-age stories and triumphant rises in our blockbusters, not the Homeric heroes battling for honor. What we're dealing with here, these are the paralyzed heroes of films noir and cyberpunk. Most importantly, there is a sense in all their stories that things could have been different, but they aren't. The relentless simplicity of social and market signals contained within Kayla's phone are reductive and terrifying but they are not falling on the deaf ears of a mindless automaton. They are falling on the ears of a complicated young human with fears and desires and a rich inner world. These stories, as distressing and appalling as they are, give us some hope that in the complexities of our own inner lives and those of our close friends and loved ones, we can escape the marketization of care and the endless quest to capture all activity and socialization under the umbrella of GDP. And this is done by simply caring for its own sake. These stories point to a common solution. Embrace spontaneity and deliberately introduce an innately human noise to market forces. Enjoy the visceral impression of the unevaluated and relish an individuation for its own sake. Contemplation on the genuine experience of conscientiousness and meditation. Using relationships to push market forces to the periphery and living in the cracks between product and spectacle.